I'm Jay Hayek. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist. I think you probably know who I am by now, but I've been at U of I for about 12 years, and we're talking about pruning. We're going to talk about pruning for form and pruning for function. All right, and I'll tell you what form and function is. So ultimately, we're going to talk about the mechanics behind pruning, pruning cuts, talk about good pruning cuts versus bad pruning cuts, all right? Because you can really butcher your trees if you don't know how to prune properly. We're going to talk about pruning for form. Ultimately, pruning for form is corrective pruning, having nice symmetry in your trees, having nice crown balance. That's what pruning for form is. Pruning for function is lateral pruning. Pruning for those high quality saw logs or potential veneer logs. That's what pruning for function is. We're also going to talk about when should you prune, which trees should you prune, and how often, and ultimately we'll kind of go over everything and try to leave as much time as possible for a Q&A. Sound good? All right, let's do it. All right, so the goals of this presentation is pruning for form and uh, pruning for function and why you should prune, how you should prune, and when you should prune, which we've already covered. So some basic concepts. Let's get the science jargon out of the way. I only have about one slide of science, and then we'll just get into the nuts and bolts of it. So target pruning. Target pruning is a technique that was developed by Dr. Alex Shigo, okay? And the focus is on this concept of branch bark ridges, which I have some pictures for you, knowing what a branch bark ridge is, Callus tissue development. Our buzzword is callus tissue, but I'm only going to define it once because it really doesn't matter. I just want to kind of uh, amaze you with some of my uh, terminology. So callus tissue is scar tissue made up of large, thin-walled cells that forms around a wound or injury. Ultimately, callus tissue is very thin-celled and contains very little lignin. And lignin is that glue that bonds cellulose and hemicellulose together. And cellulose and hemicellulose with lignin is wood. All right? So callus tissue has very, very little lignin. Wound wood is different. It is a very tough woody tissue that grows behind the callus and replaces it in that position. Wound wood. After wounding, after wounding, like when you make a pruning cut, that's a wound. All right? So after wounding, Callus tissue will develop first, and then the wound wood will replace it. Here we have a diagram of the branch bark ridge. It is this folded bark that's typically on the top side of a branch. Okay, So you have to be able to identify that because you don't want to cut into that branch bark ridge. Another key term that you need to know and understand is the branch collar. So this is our branch bark ridge, and this area here is considered the collar. We also want to avoid pruning too deeply into the branch collar. Otherwise, the wound that we've created, that wound wood, will not fully cover that wound. And then we can get decay. And we'll talk about what size limbs or what the maximum threshold is for the size of limbs or branches that you should be cutting or pruning. And I'll steal my thunder. Three inches is the max. All right? Anything over three inches, you will start to develop decay. You will not get proper wound wood development. Really important. I'm going to go through that side. So here's a schematic, kind of cartoon, of the branch bark ridge right here. Here's the branch collar. Here's the living branch here. Again, over here is a dead branch. This folded bark, just remember that folded bark. That's that branch bark ridge there. And then here's that branch collar. So when you prune, at least for this dead branch, and should you prune? Occasionally, you should, but only on your higher value trees. All right. I wouldn't encourage you to prune dead branches on your elm trees, and definitely not your ash trees. Right? Everyone's heard, kiss your ash goodbye. Yeah, we don't need to be pruning our ash trees. But on this particular example, our pruning cut would be just to the outside of that branch bark ridge. So we don't want to cut into that fold, right? We don't want to cut into that fold, so you stay outside of it. But when we cut, we don't want to cut straight down. Because if we cut, 
vertically straight down, we cut into the branch collar. And that is going to create more of an ellipse. And so the wound wood basically will take more time to cover that wound. It won't be symmetric. It'll be more of an ellipse rather than a circle. So you have more surface area for the potential of decay. Tree heal thyself. Trees don't heal, okay? Trees form a barrier zone around a wound. So a wound can be natural or it can be induced artificially by you pruning the tree. So this barrier zone separates the wound injury from healthy wood or cells. And this barrier zone is an anatomical and chemical boundary that forms after the wounding process, whether it be accidental after an ice storm or self-induced by you, the pruner. And here's an example. It's a little blurry, and I'm sorry. So here's a pruning cut, and this lighter colored tissue here is that wound wood starting to develop. And ultimately, over time, two to three years, this wound wood will completely cover or encircle, capsulate, if you will, that pruning wound, okay? And notice how it forms a complete circle. Now, if it only formed a horseshoe or a semicircle, it was a poor pruning cut. So your wound wood needs to completely encircle your pruning cuts. Really important. If you don't see that, you're probably pruning too deep or too shallow. Basic pruning tools. Use equipment that is specific to pruning. Do not whip out your MS-440 steel chainsaw to make your pruning cuts. All right? You're not going to get good wound wood development from that. All right? The cutter teeth are too big. Most pruning tools cut on the pull stroke, believe it or not. It's cut on the pull stroke for the saws, for the pruning saws. There's bypass loppers and stuff like that. We'll talk about those. So proper tools and proper pruning techniques will hasten the wound closure time, which is really important, which is what you want, right? So the longer that wound is open, the more time for pests and pathogens to potentially infect your tree or your pruning cuts. And oftentimes, you're going to have multiple pruning cuts on a single tree. And ultimately, good or proper pruning tools will train now and into the future for you, the woodland owner. Some hand pruners. Some of you actually want some hand pruners today. Congratulations. So here's some Fiskers. Bypass loppers, visualized to the right, are generally considered superior to the anvil style pruners. And the reason why is that anvil style pruners tend to crush. They crush the cells. They crush the tissue where bypass loppers or bypass pruners make a more precise cut through the wood. All right, so if you have your choice, always pick bypass pruners over anvil style. Word to the wise. Go back one. And so these hand pruners, they're great. They're optimum for stems, diameters, or twig diameters, one inches in diameter, unless you have very, very and very, very big forearms, all right? Bypass loppers, how many of you have bypass loppers? You have used them, they're great, they're nice. They come in, you know, 12 inches up to three, four feet. So very similar, there's bypass ones and there's anvil style. I always prefer the bypass loppers, okay? And they're good for branches of, you know, up to two, two and a half inches in diameter, all right? Again, a lot of times it depends on the quality of the bypass pruner and your strength, all right? So you have to know your limitations, and you have to know, you have to know your budget as well, okay? And I know someone's, uh, I didn't put this in my presentation, but, uh, you know, going tree to tree, some people will actually clean off their bypass loppers or spray them with uh, bleach or whatnot or alcohol. Um, you can do that. Now, it's really important probably to do that during the growing season like oak wilt season, let's say that you have to prune an oak tree for liability reasons, it's hanging over your house or something, 
Um, and that's oak wilt season from basically April 15th to October 15th, give or take, you know, depending on the phenology for that year, the precipitation, all that. So, you know, if you're dealing with species specifically that you might want to think about, you know, possibly using bleach every once in a while or uh, alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Hand pruning saws, which are one of my favorites. Again, these saws, they only cut in the pull stroke, okay? They're unidirectional. Um, oftentimes, they're fixed blade or they're folding blade, all right? And they're optimum for branches four to six inches in diameter. All right, very common. You can get them almost at any store now, Rural King, Big R's, what have you, forestry suppliers. Pole pruners are nice when you start pruning for function, starting to reach up into the tree to try to get some clear log length, all right? So basically, you're doing more lateral pruning more often with these pole pruners. So pole pruners, they come in fixed length, you know, six, eight, ten feet. And some have this uh, telescoping feature, which they can be extended up to lengths of, you know, 17 feet. Okay? And uh, we're going to talk about what's the optimum height to reach for when pruning saw logs, especially hardwoods, for saw log potential or veneer potential. Pole saws come also gas-powered as well. Okay? But just remember those gas-powered saws, the cut you make is not as fine as that thin pruning saw, okay? Demo. And here's an example of a gas-powered saw. So again, just to emphasize, not to be used for those fine pruning cuts, all right? So what are some major brands? Some of you have probably heard of these. You know, Felco, Fiskars, Corona, Silky, Fenco, Fano, Steel. Everyone makes a pruning saw nowadays, all right? So you'll notice that some of these are very expensive. Others are much more affordable. They're much more economical. And ultimately, you'll find out that you have multiple. You'll have hand pruners, all right? You'll have pruning saws, and you might have a telescoping saw, all right? So you have to look at costs. All right, because, you know, let's face it, you know, some of these are better than others, but, you know, should you buy a $100 one versus a $10 one, I'll leave that decision up to you. All right, it's your financial decision. And play around, you know, play around with some of these. I personally find Fiskars to be very affordable and very, very decent. So the right way to prune versus the wrong way to prune. An example of the stub cut, an example of a wrong way to prune. Basically, you're leaving that stub. So you got your branch bark ridge, you got your collar way out here. You could have actually made this cut right in here, not flush. This is an example of a flush cut. Notice the absence and the branch collar. It is gone. Why? Because this individual cut through it. Intentionally, of course, to create a PowerPoint slide. This is a perfect example of a pruning cut. We have our branch bark ridge. It's still present. You see that little bit of folded tissue, that little bit of folded bark. And you still have the branch collar. This is the optimum cut, and it's more circular, even though at this angle it kind of looks like an ellipse. But notice the surface area of the wound on the stub cut versus the surface area of a proper cut. This is going to wound over much faster, much quicker, much better versus the flush cut. Pruning large limbs, I don't want to get into too much depth and detail on this, but a lot of times you're going to have a lot of weight and you're going to have gravity working against you. So on larger limbs, if you do not put an undercut into, into the limb, Basically what you can have, and I'm sure all of you have probably seen this or witnessed it, I've done it multiple times on accident, is that you get rippage, all right? So the bark rips down, it rips through that branch collar, and you've messed up your perfect pruning cut. And that cut will not heal over, or wound over, I should say, because trees don't heal, right? They wound over, they compartmentalize the wound, be proper. 
So you make an undercut, and then on very large limbs, you can actually cut it out here, and you're saying, well, Jay, that's wrong. That's a stub cut. Well, that's fine. Come back here, notice where the branch bark ridge is, branch collar, and make your third and final cut. Now you have the perfect pruning cut on a very large limb. And the reason why we do this is to avoid this tearage that you could potentially get on those large limbs because you couldn't cut fast enough. And that's ultimately what happens. You just can't cut fast enough and the weight of that branch comes down and tears that bark. So proper pruning cuts here. So our branch bark ridge, our collar, small cut, small surface area. It's gonna wound over very quickly. Here's an example of pruned this year. You're starting to get that wound wood development. You know, this one isn't perfect. It's, it it, it kind of encapsulates or encircles the wound. And then basically, you know, two years later, you're almost getting that perfect wound wood formation. After this wound wood, now you start to get real wood development back again, okay? So wound wood isn't perfect wood yet. It's not perfect wood yet, but after you get full envelopment of that wound, then as a tree grows in diameter, you start to put real wood back over that wound, and that's what you're going for. So pruning for form, otherwise known as corrective pruning. So how many of you actively prune your hardwood trees for form and function? Okay. How many of you received cost share assistance to do that? Very few of you. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about return on investment in the absence of cost share programs, either from the state or through NRCS, you know, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Because sometimes pruning, you don't get a good return on investment. Whereas if you do get some financial system, it's almost a no-brainer, all right? How many of you have ever pruned your conifers for form? Are those individuals from Wisconsin? Okay. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. In Iowa and Illinois, which we really don't grow conifers for timber production, I would say that pruning those trees, unless it's for aesthetics purposes, that you get almost no return on investment. All right? Because we do not have a conifer or a pine market in Illinois. None. Zero. And in Iowa, I doubt it either. But in Wisconsin, yes, where you could get a reasonable return on investment for pruning your conifers. And how many of you feel comfortable selecting and pruning your future crop trees? You feel comfortable that, with that, identifying your best quality trees, the trees that already have some good form? Those have a higher return on investment. The ugly dog-looking trees that go in all different directions, have no symmetry whatsoever, kind of look like a unicorn on crack. Don't prune those trees. There's no return on investment. You're better off coppicing those trees. Coppicing is basically when you take that ugly dog tree that's you know two to four inches in diameter and you cut it off at soil level and you allow it to re-sprout. Corrective pruning is used to correct form, multiple leaders, because ultimately when we're pruning hardwoods, we want one dominant main leader. You want apical dominance. And that apical dominance encourages that tree to grow taller and straighter. So when you have multiple leaders, you want to try to eliminate one of those because you want apical dominance. Broken tops, poor branch angles, other corrective pruning measures, low forks, so on and so forth. A lot of times with low forks, I would just encourage you to coppice that. Corrective pruning is almost exclusively applied to recently planted stands, typically stands that are 3 to 12 years old. Now, I'm an advocate, so I'm talking about plantations, Re, you know, basically afforestation efforts. And I'm of the opinion, and it's just mine, that pruning natural stands, you do not get a return on investment on pruning natural stands. All right? But on plantation stands, you can. It's possible if you do it correctly. And especially if you get financial assistance through a state or federal program. 
These young trees, if defective, can still be corrected to overcome some minor issues. Some issues you can't overcome. Sometimes you just have to start over from scratch. Trees beyond corrective pruning, again, should be ignored. Just pass that tree over. Let it stay for wildlife diversity. Because ultimately, or opposite, again, cutting it off at ground level, assuming it's a hardwood, you can only do these with the hardwoods, you only can coppice a hardwood tree, because those trees will re-sprout. And then basically, you let the deer kind of pick out which re-sprout it wants to rub to death or nibble on, and then the one that escapes the nibbling and the buck rubs, well, that ultimately will become your new leader, okay, or your new tree from the base. Because if you focus your efforts on those ugly doggy trees, it's just not worth your time, it's not worth your resources, it's not worth your money. Time equals money. So here's some corrective pruning techniques. Ultimately, this is a old, oldie but goodie from Purdue. Purdue has some wonderful, wonderful pruning publications with emphasis on high value hardwood species, such as oak, cherry, and black walnut, of course, which we all love. But ultimately, corrective pruning is helping with symmetry, helping with crown balance, and finding that optimum main central leader. Okay? So basically, in this situation, we've got these upper branches that want to kind of compete with this leader. All right? So to eliminate multiple leaders, this individual, this forester, got rid of them. And this is what's left. So this guy, he said, I want this to be my main leader. I want that to pull this tree up into the sky. I'm going to eliminate the competitors. I'm going to balance this out a little bit so that it has symmetry, so that it has balance. And this is the end product. This is what you want to look for. And this is what you do for trees in stands that are about 3 to 12 years old, that corrective pruning. Here's a little larger tree. Basically, this stub was all the way out here, so you had two leaders. And in this case, he intentionally stub cut this one. And ultimately, this chosen leader, it will straighten and start reaching directly vertically for the sky. Okay? The reason why it was bending over in this way is because of the misbalance from the other competing leader. Some other methods, which I think is kind of cool, is using masking tape or duct tape. And in this instance, these two leaders were diverging like this. This is what it looked like. So we tape, so he taped them together. And then he stub cut one side to encourage this one to grow tall and straight and vertical. All right? So this is a great method. Yeah, it takes some time, but this is also your investment. All right? So you leave a, a legacy behind by planting your trees. But hopefully some of you do it as an investment, part of your financial portfolio, if not for you, for your kids or grandkids down the road. Some general rules of thumb when pruning, all right? Never remove more than 50% of the live crown of a tree. Why? Because that crown and those leaves are the photosynthetic engine of that plant, okay? So if you remove more than 50%, you are going to reduce the vigor of that individual tree. Another rule of thumb is never remove more than one-third of the live crown during any pruning event. It's a similar situation where if you start to remove too much foliage, you're taken away from the photosynthetic potential during that year. All right? And so that tree could possibly lose vigor. What happens if a drought occurs that year, that summer after you prune, and you reduce that tree's crown by over 50%? Well, that tree's going to struggle, and that struggle was based on your poor decision making. So these are several solid rules of thumb to adhere by. Prune live branches during the latter part of the dormant season. So for me, in my part of the state of Illinois, Basically, I encourage my landowners to start pruning late December through February or early March. But that depends on the phenology for that season. 
Sometimes you've seen it, you've witnessed it, where it's March, it's the second week of March, and it's 70 degrees, okay? So pay attention to the phenology, pay attention to the weather, because these dates are not set in stone. You have to read the weather. In contrast, you can prune dead branches any time of year. The branches are dead, okay? As long as you don't flush cut those dead branches, you can prune them any time of year. So pruning for function, what I often refer to as clear stem pruning or lateral stem pruning. Ultimately, we're pruning for the potential of saw logs or veneer logs. All right, so basically what we're trying to do is produce future, not free wood that is free of defect. All right, we want clear lumber. We want logs without defects for the potential of veneer logs. All right. I typically recommend, uh, recommend lateral branch pruning when the trees are about 8 to 12 feet tall. These are Jay's recommendations. Prune to a minimum height of 9 feet for high value hardwoods. So if it's 9, if you're going to prune up to 9 feet tall, your tree better be 18 feet tall because you cannot remove more than what percent of the live crown? 50. So you have to have a good balance. So if your tree is 18 feet tall, you cannot prune it up to 12 feet tall. You've exceeded the 50% threshold. So why 17 feet? Well, most hardwood saw logs, minimum log is about 8 feet 6 inches. 8 feet is optimum. The 6 inches is for trim allowance. All right, trim allowance at the sawmill. Certain hardwoods are very good self-pruners. Others, not so much. So species that shed their branches without much assistance, northern red oak, a very good self-pruner. Yellow poplar or tulip tree tulip poplar, which is not common or native to Iowa or Wisconsin, but is common native to Illinois, it's a very good self-pruner. Black cherry, depending on its location, can be a good self-pruner. Unfortunately, many high-value hardwoods need corrective pruning. Specifically, the white oak family is notorious for branching in any and all directions, as is black walnut, not a very good self-pruner. These species need your help, typically. Planting density can help, but we're not going to talk about planting density right now. Eastern white pine, pretty good self-pruner. However, you're going to have a lot of dead branches, all right? But you know, this is kind of for the Wisconsin folks where, you know, pruning conifers, yeah, you can get a return on investment depending on your markets or your geographic location to local markets. In Iowa and Illinois, I just do not see the return on investment. None. Not, a, not at all. From an aesthetics point of view, yeah, you can do it. But to think that you're going to get high value pine logs in Iowa and Illinois, not going to happen. Red pine, for the Wisconsin folks, doesn't self-prune. It will need your assistance. Rules of thumb, additional rules of thumb. Prune up to nine feet if nut production is your goal. So some of you might be interested in nut production and not necessarily wood production. Prune your best form trees, all right? Pruning takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your effort on poorly formed trees. That return on investment is not there. Highest value species. Don't be pruning your ash trees. All right, kiss your ass goodbye. We said that already. Okay, don't be pruning your box elders. All right, it's not there. Prune while your branches are small. And a general rule of thumb is to avoid pruning branches that are over three inches in diameter. Okay? 15, thank you. Some pruning do's and some pruning don'ts. You've noticed that I've used the word return on investment repeatedly. I believe that time equals money. I don't want you to waste your time. All right? It's really important to me. It's important to you. Cost share availability. It's really important to maximize return on investment. Try to get cost share assistance through your state agencies or your federal agencies. It's really important. And of course, 
attend a hands-on workshop. Extremely helpful. How many Walnut Council members or tree farm members do we have out there? Do we have many? They put on workshops all the time. Go to one of their workshops. They frequently do pruning workshops, especially, especially the Walnut Council. Quick two, I'm sorry, quick tips. Prune your best, most vigorous trees. All right, I think we've said that several times now. Avoid pruning during the growing season. Late winter, close to bud break is best. Avoid pruning branches larger than three inches in diameter. Notice that we're starting to get some redundancy here to drive the point. Leave at least 50% live crown and avoid removing one third of the live crown. Got it? Good. Some additional quick tips. I encourage people to start pruning from the top down. I encourage you from the top down because I want you to establish that dominant leader. And then once you establish that dominant leader, I want you to start looking at symmetry and balance in the tree because that's important. I don't want all your branches to be on the south side of the tree. That's poor balance. That's poor symmetry. You want good counterbalance in your prune trees. Identify the main leader. Remove any competing branches. Proceed with the removal of lower limbs and vigorous branches growing up into the tree's crown. So here we have some pictures. Step one, we've got a couple foresters here. This is a walnut pruning workshop, walnut council pruning workshop. All right, Dan Smoker and Steve Felt, they live, die, breathe, black walnut. All right, so basically they're assessing each individual tree. Is this tree actually worth pruning? If not, move on. But if it's worth resurrecting, now they're going to start looking at the top and then move down. So see if it has multiple leaders. If it has one leader, good to go. Next step, develop a plan. All right, start at the top first, move your way down. Start pruning, slowly progress to the bottom of the tree, maintain good branch and crown symmetry. Really important, you want that balance. All right, you want that balance. Start from the top, move down. And this is kind of repeat, but the branch bark ridge, branch collar, nice cut. And every once in a while, don't be bashful about grabbing that limb. That pre helps prevent tearage. All right? It helps prevent tearage. So the ultimate goal for, uh, for wood quality is basically, you know, shape and cultivating only those trees that have the potential to yield a, f a future saw log or a future veneer log, all right? Otherwise, you're wasting your time. You're not going to get that return on investment. And we're going to skip through that real quick. So here's an example of when I talked about that wound wood, when I talked about callus tissue, so you make your pruning cut, the first to show up is this callus tissue. After that callus tissue is that wound wood formation. After that wound wood, you start to get real wood development back again. So when you prune young trees, those wounds are stuck to the center of the log or the center of the tree. And then over time, over years, you get clear wood development. And then these are what we refer to as the quality zones. Okay? So when you make lumber or veneer, you're getting all this not free wood. And any knots you had are concentrated to the core. So lateral pruning for veneer logs, select the best form trees, especially these taller trees. These are all in excess of 25, 30 feet. So we're removing the live branches less than three inches in diameter. This is a walnut plantation, so it's actually worth it. You can get a return on investment by pruning these trees. Remove any dead branches, and remember you can remove any dead branches any time of year, okay, as long as you make a proper pruning cut. And, you know, something that you should do, part of your plan, ultimately, when you think about a pruning operation is, you know, your species. This happens to be a monoculture of black walnut, but in a lot of your CRP tree plantings, you might have five, eight, ten, 12 different species, and certain species are great for diversity, but they're not going to produce high-quality saw logs or veneer logs. 
So some of our white oak species like bur oak and swamp white oak, not that you can't get quality saw logs or veneer logs from those species in the white oak family, but they just, you know, it's almost a crapshoot at times. So you have to know or identify your species to find out which ones you can get the best return on investment. Diameter plays a role, merciful height, defect, you know, grade or product class. Ultimately, you're seeing which trees deserve your time and effort. Okay, so if you don't have a plan and you just go out and start pruning everything, I'm afraid you're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of resources. So get a plan. And sometimes that plan includes knowing what's out there, having a stand in inventory, and basically calling out or sequestering technical assistance from a professional forester, if you can find one. I know they're you know, dying breed sometimes. So this particular stand is a black walnut plantation in southern Illinois. It's extremely well groomed, all right, very well manicured, and ultimately the goal for this landowner, landowner is high quality saw logs. It is for veneer production. So this individual landowner is pruning up to a minimum of 17 feet. 8 feet 6 plus 8 feet 6 equals 17 feet. So he's going for that optimum butt log, which is that first 17 feet in a tree. But beforehand, basically, they're going through their entire plantation and flagging which trees they want to prune and the others that they're not. They're not going to waste their time on the dogs. Go for the winners. Go for the blue ribbon trees, the ones that have shown that they have good form and good potential. And here's just some samples or, you know, yeah, sample slides or whatnot. So he has a telescoping pruner, okay? It's not mechanized, all right? And basically, he's reaching up to about, you know, 19 feet if he can. You know, 18 feet is kind of that goal, or seven, I'm sorry, 17 feet is kind of that goal for hardwoods. Once you go above that, I'm not sure that you're going to get adequate return on investment. But 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, anywhere up to 17 feet if you can. Clear stem pruning on northern red oak trees that are, you know, over 30 feet tall. Again, for this particular landowner, northern red oak can produce high quality saw logs. It can produce high quality veneer logs. So in this case, because the trees are over 30, 35 feet tall, we're pruning up to 17 feet. Notice it is the dormant season. Very, very important for oak species, right? Because of oak wilt. Avoid pruning at all costs from April 15th, between April 15th and October 15th. Can you correct the poor form on this guy? No, it's a dog. Don't waste your time on those, all right? But these guys, but this is a natural grown tree and you're not gonna be actually doing any pruning in natural forest dance, typically, typically. Maybe one out of a thousand, you might go into a young natural stand where you do some pruning. Not one out of a thousand, maybe one out of a hundred of a nice young natural regenerating stand. So when should you prune? Basically, I've heard the old adage, when should you prune? Whenever the saw is sharp. So whenever your saw is sharp, you go prune. I disagree. Some people say you can prune walnut all year round. I still disagree. I always prune during the dormant season. Why? Pests and pathogens during the growing season. You've just created wound, a wound or multiple wounds on a single tree. And if you pruned 400 trees over a four acre period, those are 400 wounds. A lot of pests and pathogens during the growing season. That's why I'm a staunch advocate of dormant season pruning, regardless of species. The only exception, the only caveat, is if you have major weather-related storm damage. In that case, I may do some pruning, all right? Dormant season pruning, best for hardwoods and conifers. You have less sap and resin, no airborne pathogens, no insects. It just makes sense to do it during the dormant season. Dead branches, again, can be removed any time of year. How high do we go? We typically want to go 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, up to 17 feet. I typically stop at 17 feet. I don't think the return on investments there past 17 feet for hardwoods. I don't. 
And 17 feet is the kicker because more than 75% of the value is going to be in that first 17 feet. That's why. That's why I stop at 17. Can you get logs, veneer logs, and saw logs beyond 17 feet? Absolutely. But it's all about return on investment. It's about time. Ideal pruning height, you know, based on the height of this tree. So basically, we have 9 feet. We have 17, so that's 26, and almost another 26. So basically, the first lift, if you can, for this particular species, I'm gonna, the first lift will be 9 feet because I'm not removing more than 50% of the canopy. So then I might do my second lift two or three years down the road. Again, you don't. What's our rule of thumb about 50% live crown? You want to maintain it. All right? So oftentimes, you will prune in series over the course of multiple years. Don't think that you have to get it all done in one year. Spread it out. It's really important. And uh, we're pretty much done. And so here's our minimum saw log length, 9 feet. So prune up to 9 feet if you can. All right? Don't just prune to 4 feet. I'm talking about saw log and veneer log production. All right? You're not going to get a saw log or a veneer log four feet. All right? So if you're going to prune, if you're going to invest your time, shoot for that eight to nine feet. And with that, I'm going to cut it, right, give or take, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, so the gentleman asked, so he's got a bunch of walnut trees that now look like walnut bushes due to deer herbivory and damage. And when we talk about coppicing, those type of trees that are now look like bonsai trees, no longer resemble a real tree, we coppice those, okay? Coppicing means you cut it off at the soil level, you allow them to re-sprout. Start over again, because you're not going to be able to correct those trees. It'll never amount to a saw log. It will never amount to a veneer log. Rubbing, it all depends on how deep the rubbing. The question was, like, for buck rubs. Now, if it just sloughs off a little bit of bark, that's okay, but if it goes past the bark into the cambium layer or possibly into the phloem and xylem, then you can start to get decay. And then in that case, sometimes you just leave those trees. You leave them because the bucks are already rubbing them. There might be some scent around there, so you just leave those for buck rub trees. Okay? So there's a compromise. You've got to give the deer something. Uh, so maybe something that's ornamental maybe something adjacent to the home, but anything over three inches, I'm not going to do from a timber production, timber quality standpoint. That's my threshold. Yeah, it, it will. So the question is, basically, he has a tree, and uh, how tall was the tree? About 15 feet tall, and it, it received some top damage, but you didn't identify how big the tree was. What the diameter? about an inch. In a case like that, if that tree were larger, let's say you had a 16-inch diameter tree and the top busted out of it, would you coppice that tree? No. Cut it down and make a saw log out of it, even though it's small. But basically, a one-inch diameter tree that's 15 feet tall that's had the top broken out of it, I'd coppice that tree. Absolutely. Because it's going to resprout from a vigorous root system. And oftentimes, within two to three years, it will be equal to the height of the tree before the damage. Yeah, so the question was on some large, larger diameter trees, maybe from like 16 to upwards of even 24 inches in diameter. After you have a timber sale, some of those stumps will re-sprout, okay? And a lot of times, it's a function of species, genetics, age, so they all play a role. So I've seen some, you know, 30-inch stumps re-sprout, but they were just really vigorous specimens. And it depends on species, also age. So the larger the tree, the older it is, basically the probability of stump sprouting decreases precipitously. Uh, with a caveat, there are certain natural stands that just are so beautiful, have a perfect species mix, and actually are exhibiting good form in a natural setting where there may be a good return on investment. No. So the question was, can you not add value to a natural stand? The, yes, you can add value to it through pruning and through crop tree management. So, yeah, that was a bad blanket statement. I tried to throw that caveat on in there, like one in a hundred natural stands probably will not have a good return on investment. That was probably a number. 
yes, you can get return on investment. And basically what I would encourage you to do is ask your forester if it's worth your time and effort. Excellent question. So when you coppice a species, whether it be walnut, white oak, northern red oak, any hardwood, any angiosperm, you want not an angled cut. You want it as low to the ground as possible. And you want it flat. Yep, not angled. Excellent question. So it all depends where the sprouts originate. If, they, if, they, if the sprouts originate high on the stump, you are going to inevitably incur decay in those stems. So the lower your stump sprouts originate, closer to the soil, then less potential for decay in the future. So if they're really high stumps and they're sprouting, it's not, not worth your time. Or just leave it and let the deer browse them. Do you ever use pruning paint? No. But. No but. All right. So during the growing season, let's say you have damage to a yard tree or something like that, an oak, and basically you have to prune it. Maybe for liability reasons, aesthetics, it's just going to get worse. It's going to you know, tear down more bark. In that instance, in that situation, for that genus, which oak, I would consider using pruning paint. But for your plantations and whatnot, do not, I repeat, do not use pruning paint. It interferes with wound wood development. That's why.